having me here. Um, so, uh, just a bit of background information about the Landmark Trust, if you don't know who we are. Um, we look after about 200 buildings up and down the country, um, England, Scotland and Wales, um, literally from top to bottom, side to side. Um, so, uh, and, and we have a, a, a small handful in Europe as well. Um, but uh, most of our buildings kind of exist quite quietly. We, um, we, was, we were, uh, Lamarck Trust came into being 50 years ago. It was founded by a chap called Sir John Smith, who was infuriated by um, the demise of so many of the smaller historic buildings, those that kind of weren't being picked up by the National <coughs> Trust or English Heritage and were just kind of, you know, being sold or demolished um, and disappearing from our countryside. So he set up the Landmark Trust, and, and basically the principle in you know 50 years ago was really simple. You buy these buildings for almost nothing, or sometimes they were given to him. Um, you raise the money, you restore them, and then they were let for holidays. Um, and that principle existed um, sort of quite quietly for many, many years. Um, but in recent years, our model has really shifted and changed because heritage is now um, kind of at the forefront of everybody's minds, and um, whilst buildings are still desperately in need, getting hold of them can sometimes be a much more complicated and costly process. So we are now engaged, as everybody else is, in doing a lot of fundraising for our buildings. Um, and uh, sometimes um, we've been asked to be involved in projects that we've known to be much more complicated that won't necessarily fit into the original kind of premise of what the Landmark Trust was. And Clue and Kellen was definitely one of these sites, because it's more than just one building, um, where we knew that we would have to take on a completely different uh, approach to our project work. Um, we've been lucky many times in the past to be funded by the Heritage Lottery, but as anyone who, who has been lucky enough to get lottery funding knows, the bar just gets raised ever higher and you just have to keep pulling out more rabbits out of more hats that you ever thought you could ever possibly do. Um, and Clue and Kellen has really challenged us. Um, it is an absolutely fantastic building um, uh, in an uh, absolutely idyllic spot in the Black Mountains which is part of the Brecon Beacons in Wales. Um, uh, so why save Clue and Kellen? Um, when we first took on the building, and actually up until about a month ago, uh, we thought that it dated back to about 1485. Uh, but we've recently discovered through some um, kind of quite innovative new testing techniques that Swansea University have been experimenting with, um, that it was actually built much earlier in 1420. And that's quite significant in terms of Welsh history, because you're talking about uh, the Welsh rebellions um, and where Clue and Kellen sits right in the border country, uh, we know that that area was particularly heavily um, basically destroyed. <laughs> so there was not much left standing after the Welsh rebellions. So the fact that the building dates back earlier to when we first thought we did kind of opens up a whole new chapter in its history that we're having to go back, so we're having to rethink it at quite a late stage in our, in our um, uh, conservation work actually. Um, it sits at the mouth of the Lantoni Valley, which is an absolutely beautiful valley, which has inspired uh, artists for uh, hundreds of years. So uh, William Turner visited it, uh, Allen Ginsberg visited it, and, and I think he took some LSD and wrote some interesting poetry while sitting on a, on a, on a Hatterall Ridge talking to sheep or whatever he was, it was he was doing. Um, and more recently, it's become a real kind of hub for um, artists and writers. It, it, the, the Langtony Valley basically uh, kind of connects Hay on Wye uh, with Abergavenny. So it's a really interesting uh, part of the world. Um, and it continues to be a very kind of uh, um, artistic place, and a, and a, but a place of kind of spiritualness and solace as well. Um, it's a medieval hall house. Um, when it was first listed in the 1950s, um, it was still lived in, and it was still lived in up until the point that we took the building on. Um, and so it was actually quite difficult to get access to it. So it, it's it's the, the focus of its listing has changed since we've started working on the building because we've just been able to discover so much more about it. But even at the point when it was listed, 
Kadu knew that it was incredibly important um, as a very high status, what they thought at the time was a domestic building. Um, but it was stone built, uh, which again was quite unusual in those days. Everything around it was still being built or rebuilt in, uh, in, in as a timber crack frame building. Um, but Glen Callan was, was built from stone and it is this sort of incredibly kind of powerful structure which, which sits on the hillside. Um, it's a very complex site as well, which made thinking about its future really quite difficult because it would have been very easy uh, for you know, to, to kind of come to the conclusion that, oh, well, one day it will be sold and it will be converted into a number of different dwellings, holiday homes or, or whatever. Um, but because the out, a lot of the outbuildings are quite rare survivals, both Caddo and Brecon Beacons National Park knew that they, they wanted it to be treated with respect. They wanted the, the, the quality and the, um, the original purpose of the building still to, to remain, at, you know, visually at the heart of what you could see from, from the outside. Um, and it was considered to be the most important at-risk inhabited building in Wales. So, um, you know, people were very, very worried about it. And in the 1990s, Cadu um, actually put a, a, a scaffold roof pretty much, well, over the whole site um, because they were so worried that just the amount of water that was getting into the building was going to mean it wasn't going to survive. If I just go back um, you can see the bottom picture um, the, sort of the, the, the white sheeting with the green uh, uh, tin roof over it so that's the building hidden under there and then you can see the cluster of outbuildings just um, around the outside of it and because of where it sits at the mouth of the Lantoni Valley um, it, it's sort of on that tourist trail on that tourist route and actually that photograph um, is, was taken after we'd resheeted it, um, but because it had been sheeted for about 10 years, for most of that time, all that sheeting was torn and it was flapping around in the wind and the tin roof had pretty much fallen off because the, the owners at the time, even though Caddy had, had done what they could to protect it, couldn't afford to keep redoing that protection. So it, it really was a desperately sad looking building in, in a very important location. Um, you can see there some of the, the details that existed in the building. We've got um, the original medieval dais bench at the high end of the hall. We've got some uh, lovely carvings over the doorways. Um, but then the, sorry, quite small picture on the, on the bottom right. Um, in one of the back rooms, lots of acro props propping the whole thing up from the inside. Very difficult when you look at some of those photographs to imagine that someone was still living in it at that time. Um, and, and the build, only one section of the building was livable and the rest was pretty much full of water. There were just puddles of water on the floor. Uh, the water was coming, coming in through the roof and uh, through the back of the house, um, literally the, the, through the mountain. The, 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 the land had kind of shifted and fallen up against the house and all the water was just flowing <coughs> through the building, all the rainwater was running off. Um, that's a picture of, of the um, kind of the medieval uh, building. Um, so you've got the hall on the right hand side, and then you've got the solar wing, which is uh, which is the cross wing. Um, and in the mid 17th century, it had a first floor put in over the hall and a chimney stack put in. But originally, the chimney stack wouldn't have been there, um, and the hall would have been open to the to the ceiling. And we we were definitely sure of that. Because um, it wasn't long after the after you know this period that buildings were being built with fireplaces and with first floors, but we know because of the smoke blackening, and you can tell from the way that the timbers have been cut in certain places that the first floor was was inserted after the building was built. Um, so, in terms of uh, what we sort of had to decide to do, we were we were approached by Cadu in two thousand and six, who knew our work. So we've got quite a nice cluster of buildings in Wales which we're very proud of. And we've worked with Caddy quite closely before um, on all our projects. Um, so they came to us in 2006 and said, look, we've got this real problem. We've got this amazing uh, house. It's in desperate need. It's still being lived in. We're concerned about the house, and we're also concerned about the people who are living in it. Um, it, was, it was being lived in by two brothers. Their father had died in the 90s, and, and really with the death of their father, um, 
that the two brothers could no longer really cope with running a farm. It's basically subsistence farming um, and looking after a grade one listed building and all the outbuildings. It, w it was just such a huge thing for them to do. And, and so sadly, they sort of sat back and did nothing. Um, but in many ways, the fact that very little had been done to the building for so many years sort of preserved it. It, it didn't necessarily do it much good, but it preserved it. It preserved those original features because no one was sort of modernising it or changing um, bits inside it. Um, so the first important thing was to consult with the community, but also to negotiate with Brecon Beacons National Park and to get permission um, to, well, for, to enable, the, to help the brothers to get permission to um, build a new house so that they could carry on farming the land. So it was really important that they weren't sort of turfed off their, their home um, or, or their land as well as their home. Um, and so, to cut a very long story short, it, it took years to negotiate this, but they uh, built a new high-tech, very high-tech, very green cottage at the bottom of the trackway and now they're still farming uh, the Clue and Kellen, you know, the original farm, the farm land whilst we've taken on the medieval building and uh, all the um, historic outbuildings as well. Um, so uh, we had to then raise uh, 3.6 million pounds, <laughs> um, which again took a, a long old while, and we were lucky that we got 2.5 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund. But the key to that really was the community involvement and the amount of engagement that we um, <coughs> promised we would do. Um, and we started on site in April 2016 and we've got about a year to go um, so we've still got lots to do <laughs> um, but it, so far it's been a really exciting project to work on and in terms of training and traditional skills it's something that the Landmark Trust have been involved with for many many years we've always worked with local contractors we've always been very pleased when people have been able to support uh, young apprentices and we've always kind of taken that very seriously and encouraged our contractors and the people that we work with to work to, to, to bring along young apprentices. Um, but in terms of a formal, a very sort of formalised approach, um, that's something that's come about in, in recent years and we've worked in partnership particularly with the Prince's Foundation. So I think for about the last four or five years we've taken on, for most of our projects, we've taken on about three or four of the Prince's Foundation apprentices and given them um, kind of a live experience of working on site with our contractors. And that's been hugely successful and, and kind of ticked lots of boxes for everybody. But what we realised at Clue and Kellen was that we could actually take that one step further. Um, and that's just a, a, a kind of a layout of the site, a bird's eye view of the site. So you've got the medieval farmhouse at the top and then you've got the outbuildings sort of clustered around it. Um, and really because we've got these kind of cluster of buildings, each with their own different needs and each with a range of different conservation principles that we're working towards. So obviously the medieval farmhouse, we, you know, we're, we're, we're absolutely doing 100% to conserve all the original features. It's, a, it's as light touch as we can possibly uh, 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 do. Um, in some of the other buildings, we can use those as an opportunity to work with volunteers and to train people up who may not necessarily know that that's what they want to do. <laughs> um, so take, you know, be a bit more risky in terms of working with, with the community because in the end it is a risk. And certainly when we were, um, you know, uh, uh, going through the tendering process with our contractors, that was something that we had to write in very, very clearly from the outset and say to them, there are going to be volunteers on site, there are going to be people who may know nothing about historic buildings, there are going to be people who may have no skills at all, there may be people on site who are actually very, very skilled, who've retired and want to carry on kind of working within the sort of heritage sector as volunteers. And they're going to get in your way, basically. Um, and so it was being very clear with our contractors and saying we need to kind of negotiate at a very early stage how we're going to deliver this. 
and luckily, because um, the, the contractors that, that we work with um, know that there is a massive skills shortage, so it's in their interest to, to be as flexible as, as they possibly can. So what we said we would do is that we would basically um, have four uh, weeks, I'll just skip forwards, we would have four weeks where we would um, do something called Heritage at Work. So there would be four dedicated weeks where we would have volunteers on site, where we would do training, where we would have study days, so individual study days, um, looking at perhaps uh, landscape and farming issues as well as building conservation issues, quite technical days as well, where we would also invite schools, other community groups to come along and visit, so that the contractors would know that they would have to kind of think ahead um, and, and, and just change perhaps you know, their, their plans for those weeks and not decide to have a crane on site and start um, uh, you know, doing major construction work like that, but, but just to kind of you know, tailor their workload to, to fit in around the sorts of things that we wanted to be doing. Um, and that worked really, really well. So we've done our four weeks now. Um, amazingly, and the first week was a bit terrifying. Um, weren't really sure what was going to happen, um, but it all went remarkably smoothly. And I think, from our point of view, we we just had a general call for volunteers. We, we've already got a small volunteer network within the Landmark Trust, um, but we also use the other networks in in that area of Wales as well to uh, to call for volunteers. Um, but each time we've done a week, we've kind of, the word of mouth has basically broadened for us, but we've also started to target particular groups that we knew existed, which has been absolutely fantastic. Um, but it has been an absolute pleasure. It's been absolutely exhausting, but it has been an absolute pleasure to be there and to, to organise these weeks, um, partly because of the range of people that we've um, managed to get involved. Um, so we've had our traditional kind of landmark audience um, uh, who, ha who know our work and wanted, who were very, very excited to be given an opportunity to actually come along to one of our projects and do something and, you know, have this sense of ownership over a, over a conservation project, which was absolutely brilliant. We've had um, some of the younger apprentices from the Princess Foundation, so the 16 to 18 year olds as well. So we had a, uh, a group of seven of them who came along as well and worked alongside the adults. We've also had sort of the random people who just find out about it on the grapevine um, and who sign up for these weeks and come along, some of whom are perhaps homeowners and want a bit of practical experience before they tackle their own project at home. Um, some of them are students who are perhaps um, on other courses, whether they are um, conservation courses or just uh, uh, sort of traditional, traditional straight pure architecture courses and they actually want to do something a bit more hands-on. Um, or sometimes just people who kind of thought, hey, I just want to try something different. And I think that's what's made those weeks successful because everyone's had a different reason for being there and then has kind of come together around this common goal and this common purpose. Um, but one of the other keys to the weeks was making sure that the, all the volunteers were um, trained really well and supported really well during that week. Now again, we were very, very, very lucky because the, this particular corner of Wales, the, the, the south, the, in South Wales, um, it seems to be a real uh, kind of hub and a network of um, uh, companies and individuals who are interested in that crossover between heritage crafts and green building technology as well. So there's a fantastic um, organisation down there called Timar, who um, they, they kind of brand themselves as sort of ecological building pro pro products, um, but they also do an, a huge amount of heritage consultancy as well. And so they have come along and supported each one of the weeks that we have done and basically given the volunteers, you know, just the most amazing training in everything from kind of repointing to plastering to doing carpentry work um, and just been open and on hand to deal with um, questions that, that people have, as I say, about their own building projects or about their own studies, uh, their own career paths, things like that. And so 
the, volu the, the volunteers have been fantastic, but what we've learned from it is that it has to be a two-way thing. So you can get an immense amount of work out of volunteers if you keep them well fed. <laughs> I think food is a recurring theme. <laughs> um, but it's, it's also about nurturing um, this next generation as well, whether this next generation are 16-year-olds or whether they are 70-year-olds. They are all part of kind of continuing to, to, to kind of talk about our heritage, to, but you know, specifically to talk about how we look after our heritage as well. And so they they kind of they become our kind of apostles really. We send them out into the wide world and we say, tell everyone about what you've learned here this week. Um, and it's very easy to look at a building like New and Kelling and kind of go, oh, it's grade one listed. You know, what does that mean to anybody else in the outside world? But the other message that that we've been very clear about in, in all the kind of study days and training videos and other bits and pieces that we've done is to say to people, it doesn't matter. You know, if you are in a traditional building all of these things that you're learning, all of, the, all of the things that you're seeing that we are doing on site are absolutely 100% relevant to your own particular circumstance. Um, so whether it, you know, you're in a little cottage or, or whether you're in a, in a listed building, it, it, it makes no difference. Um, you can still learn to look after it properly. Um, and pass it on to the next generation. Um, kind of some of the other things that we've we've done. Uh, the dry stone warning has also been an incredibly important part of the project. Um, so the dry stone warning and other kind of landscape related um, work that we've had to do. So whether that's um, planting a new orchard or planting hedging, uh, we're going to be doing some hedge laying this uh, winter as well. Um, in terms of the setting of the building as well, making sure that we, we, we treat the surrounding um, countryside properly as well. And again, linking in with organisations such as the Young Farmers as well, um, to give the young folk who live in the valley and in the surrounding areas an opportunity to get involved from those, from those points of view as well. Um, I'll just skip back one slide. Um, in terms of the other kind of important thing that we identified very early on in the project was what to do with those outbuildings. Because it's very easy to say, oh, well, well, we'll restore them, we'll conserve them, we'll make sure they're not leaking, we'll, we'll make sure walls aren't falling down. But unless they've got a use, it's, it's sort of, you know, there's no point really. Um, so that was absolutely critical, that we don't just mothball buildings, that we don't just do what we need to do and then kind of lock them up. Um, so again, con consulting with the local community was absolutely important and we were, you know, fair to say very early on, sort of slightly worried that we may not find a use for these buildings and that really was a, you know, key to um, us deciding whether we would take them on or not. Um, and so we sat down with the locals and we said, look guys, what do you think? You know, can, can, you know, we're all really concerned about these buildings but we need your help to make this project work. We knew that they had a lovely village hall um, in the valley, and and the and the, the kind of the community in the valley is sort of quite scattered. It's it's farming, so these are all small hill farms. So the village is actually a scattering of houses, uh, you know, across the hillside. Um, but the community network is, is was actually surprisingly strong. They're all sort of bond together at the local pub or when they do the village pantomime, those sorts of things which uh, bring everyone together. Um, so we started a local history group, that was one of the things that we did which has been amazingly successful um, and also through our consultation that the community came forward and said to us well we yes we've got our village hall and yes we as all village halls it can be a bit of a struggle to maintain it but we give you our blessing to turn the threshing barn into a community use space because one of the things that they um, knew that, that the village hall couldn't provide was a long-term use of the space, so an exhibition area. Obviously, it's a very creative area. They have lots of artists in the area, lots of visiting artists as well. And one of the things that the community hall often gets asked to do is to, is to be a sort of a temporary exhibition space, but they can't do that. Neither can they cater for necessarily for large school groups or for uh, sort of messy workshops, craft-based workshops. So we all agreed that that was absolutely fantastic because that's what we could do. We could set up a space in the threshing barn uh, with a small bunk house as well in the granary and turn the old, what we call the sheep yard, where the sheep dip was, 
we fill that area in um, and that could be an outside yard as well um, so it gives the buildings this onward use and whilst it's not farming <laughs> um, it is in the spirit of farming because we'll be able to use those spaces for all sorts of kind of heritage craft related things um, and you know that threshing barn will, will pretty much stay as this big kind of um, you know, a, a, a big airy threshing barn space, which is exactly what we wanted to do. We didn't want to kind of subdivide it into lots of little rooms or anything like that. So we were able to keep that as a as a kind of a, as a proper barn-like space, which is great. Um, the Beast House, which is the photograph at the top, um, that will become a small walk-in interpretation room. And again, we knew that we would never be able to afford to do anything high tech because as soon as you start sticking computers and technology into a space you have to start maintaining it and keeping it warm and keeping the bats out of it and all of those sorts of things so we decided that whatever we would do in terms of an interpretation stroke museum space would be very low tech I think we're going to have a wind up listening post I think that's about as high tech as it goes um, and so that's, that's the plan for that room, and I'm just in the, the stages now of sort of planning that space out with the local community. So because the history group has been so successful, um, you, you know, they're really sort of engaged and involved in this kind of museum room stage of the project as well, and kind of making sure that it communicates all the different layers of the Green Kellen project and, and, and the building work that we're doing, but also serves a function in terms of, of introducing tourists and visitors to the valley and just kind of sending them on their way um, to go and explore the Priory and then to carry on to, to Hay on Wye and to, and to do all those lovely things. Um, and, and so that's, that's what that will become. Um, and we'll also be employing a, um, a kind of a part-time coordinator who will just manage the bookings for the threshing barn space and kind of be the key holder and, and kind of the, the person who welcomes groups to that space and things like that. The actual, uh, the, the medieval house itself will have two housekeepers who look after that. So it's quite nice to be able to employ, not full-time, but three, possibly four uh, local people as well as part of the project. Um, one of the other really successful and lovely parts of the project was the furniture making, which wasn't something that appeared in our um, lottery application um, in the initial stages, but it's something that kind of bubbled under the, bubbled up as an opportunity. Um, and I think it's one of the interesting things about writing funding applications. You do all your research beforehand and you're really kind of, you know, working hard to discover um, as much as you can about a place. And sometimes it's not until you start um, and I don't know whether that's whether you know people just think oh it's never going to happen or you know perhaps you're, you're, you're so focused on particular groups that, that you know that the, the web doesn't go you know doesn't get cast uh, far enough um, but in the lottery projects that I've been involved with you always find this a, a, a couple, sometimes it's just a couple of weeks or a couple of months into the project suddenly all these other people start coming out of the woodwork, <laughs> which is absolutely lovely. And so I think you need to build lots of flexibility into these projects. And one of the chaps who came out of the woodwork quite early on was, was a, a local, uh, he's, a, he's a green woodworker and he makes Welsh stick furniture. And he has been an absolute gem because he's a young lad, he's self-taught, um, but he just makes the most delightful furniture. And he's worked with... Um, uh, some groups of uh, NBQ uh, level one and two students um, who are already on a furniture course, but they're doing kind of um, very prepped furniture. They're learning how to make dovetail joints and they're learning how to, you know, put, you know, working with veneers and things like that. Uh, whereas Gareth turned up with literally a van full of logs and said, right, we're going to make furniture out of this lot. And they were a bit kind of like, oh, and he gave them axes as, as their tools and set up a pole lathe in the yard and things like this. And it was just really lovely to see these furniture students and their faces literally dropped and they kind of thought, we can't make furniture out of this lot. But by the end of the week, they were in seventh heaven. They were absolutely loved it, working out in the sunshine, um, you know, sawdust everywhere and, and just made some really, really, well, they made a really beautiful chair. And then we repeated that exercise with some adult volunteers as well. 
um, who uh, who made a milking stall. Um, and so that has been, and, and Gareth has actually gone on and, and done several other pieces for us as well. So that's been a real kind of success story. We've also done um, well, just some more pho photographs there of, of various different people working. Uh, the chaps up in the top right hand corner, they, um, they were working on a lottery funded project for us in Warwickshire um, at Astley Castle and they were my landscape volunteers there. And they enjoyed uh, working at Astley Castle so much that when I mentioned Wales to them, they said, oh, can we come? And I said, of course you can. So, um, so they came along for three days. They've been twice now and they've been uh, building styles and they've been putting, building these tree guards for our new orchard trees. Um, and most of the people who, it's a bit of a mix, some, some are local, uh, some are from much further field, like the, the, the gang from Warwickshire, and they all stay in a bunkhouse over at Langtony Priory, um, which is a really nice experience for them, because the bunkhouse is right next to the ruins of the Priory, so you kind of wake up with this magical landscape around you, and kind of sheep bleating, and, and uh, beautiful moonlit nights, and, and you know, walking in the evening, and things like that. So food and good places to stay, that's been the, and a, and a good pub nearby as well, that's, that's, been, that's been a good thing. Um, one of the other things we've done that's involved uh, locals, um, both from a kind of history point of view, but also from a practical point of view, um, has been our um, artist in residence um, scheme. Again, uh, something that um, was kind of quite integral to the lottery application was getting local artists involved to help us document the project. And again, um, as these things do, we, we had a uh, you know, really good healthy number of submissions from local artists. We definitely, we, we asked local artists to, to get involved. Um, and then we selected our four key artists, three, three visual artists and one writer. And then, of course, you find it very hard to ignore the other applications that you said no to. So somehow we've managed to kind of shoehorn them in as well, um, doing various bits and pieces with us, whether, whether it's been open day events, um, do, doing sort of drawing workshops with, uh, with, with folks who've come along to explore the, the kind of the architecture in different ways uh, or to explore the work of other artists. Or, again, in the case of Gareth, our, our um, wood, uh, woodworker, um, he's been along for open days as well, just to give sort of short demonstrations to people too. But this, uh, the photography that you see there is a chap called Jamie Lake, um, who uh, wanted to work um, on the site before our contractors started work. So he wanted to document the fragility of the building. So he did these remarkable photographs where he basically lit the, um, the fractures in the building. Um, and that one there in the, the gable end of the threshing barn, which, which is kind of faces out onto the road, is just a very, very dramatic um, uh, sort of lighting installation and a very dramatic image and just shows how precarious uh, the, some of the structures were. Um, I mean, our structural engineer uh, probably said, you know, we've probably just got months Maybe, maybe a couple of years before something serious was going to happen to, to the buildings. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's been a, a, a fantastic opportunity to save something um, that was literally at the brink um, of becoming a derelict shell and, and you know, to, to kind of involve the local community um, so wholeheartedly in everything that we've done. Um, and, you know, that is still something that's evolving we've got another year to go on the project um so we hope that they can kind of continue to be involved and continue to to uh input into our project and our thinking um and to to leave their legacy behind as well i think that's it there we go yeah. <laughs>